So welcome uh, to all of you. Welcome here at the uh, award ceremony of Archipri 2023. We're here at Eindhoven Technical University, Casa Vertigo. And we're so grateful that they were able to host this show and host the exhibition and above all this award ceremony today. My name is uh, Katja Edens, I'm an architectural historian and I have a special connection to Archipri for the longest time, longer than I care to mention here. Also Archipri International, which is also part of the uh, exhibition here, I think it's, it's over there, the latest edition, 2021, um, hopefully not the last edition. And also I have had um, relations with Archipri over the years, done many things, uh, with them, and uh, I feel honored and excited to be here. Archibri is offering the stage to young talent in the field of architecture, urban planning, landscape architecture, interior architecture, and distinguishing the very best as the winners of Archibri. This is a beautiful and also important task, especially in this era where we are living in today, where we see ourselves confronted with all kinds of challenges. You all know what I am talking about, energy, water, biodiversity, but also social justice, inclusivity and more. We need all the spatial ingenuity that we can find and actually helps us finding it, finding the young talent. So a warm welcome to all of you participants that are here today and maybe your parents, maybe your grandparents, brothers, sisters, maybe friends that have joined you. Also a warm welcome to all the representatives of the participating educational institutes and of course to everyone else that decided to come here this beautiful morning, weather is getting better. And that is a good thing, so for the Dutch Design Week that we are kicking off here as well today. So a quick impression of the program. It's a big program, it's very rich and packed, and at the very end we'll have the actual award giving. First some words of welcome, then you will be treated to a lecture that has been programmed especially for this occasion by Arginet. Then there will be an impression of this generation of Archipri participants by jury member uh, Bruno Vermeers. I will join him for a conversation after that with some of the participants and we will conclude with the actual awards. But first, some words of our host today. He is assistant professor at the Chair of Architectural History and Theory here at Eindhoven Technical University. And also he is director of programming of this beautiful exhibition hall, Casa Vertigo. Please give him a warm welcome, Dr. Sergio Figueiredo. Hello everyone, thank you Katia for that warm introduction. Katia forgot to mention that I'm also her doctoral advisor. Some of you already know. <laughs> anyway. Um, welcome to Vertigo, to Vertigo, Vertigo is the building, Casa Vertigo is the exhibitions program of the Department of the Built Environment. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, Casa Vertigo, we have a long tradition, uh, it's one of the longest running uh, exhibition programs in any architecture school in the world. It was first established in 1970 as the Committee for Special Activities. And since then, it has been our mandate throughout the various directorships to provide our architecture students and our staff with different ideas and different inputs uh, into how architecture can and should be made. And Archipri is a really good example of that, how these different ideas are put together and show the best of what the Netherlands' spatial ingenuity has to offer. Anyway, welcome. Uh, sometimes it's good to come out of the rank stuff, right? <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you, Sergio. Um, then I would like to introduce to you someone who is of great importance to Archipri. He is, since this year, the new chair of the Archipri Foundation, a role that is traditionally a linking pin 
between the education of special, spatial design and the reality of development, building and architecture. He is director of BPD Studio and BPDI City Developers. Please give him a warm round of applause. Let's get from the closer. Thank you, Katja. It's a big honor for me to, uh, to be here as a new chair of the, uh, of the uh, RGP Foundation. It's important that today we celebrate the work of uh, the young designers uh, of the future, you could say. It's a contest, and nowadays we have to reflect on the idea of the contest. We are looking for competitors, but especially we are looking for um, contesters, so people, participants, people who uh, claim to see the future of uh, our design profession. Um, very important to be, uh, to be the chair of this uh, foundation, because the new generation uh, yeah, address the new issues uh, stated by uh, Katja earlier before, uh, stated the new issues of our profession, the possibility of our profession, and uh, the value of our profession in, in, in to imagine uh, uh, the future problems and the ideas uh, of the designers in the solutions we are looking for. So uh, I'm very glad here to be here to celebrate uh, the results uh, and creating together uh, a network of, uh, of explorers of the future and the role uh, which design can play in this exploration of the future. So thank you very much and I hope you enjoy this uh, event. Thank you very much. Yes, um, next part of the program. I would like to introduce introduce to you one of the jury members of this year. It is someone who specializes on a smaller scale of architecture. In his case, this concerns interiors, but also the smallest forms of housing. Uh, he studied at Ghent University, but has since many years been working in the Netherlands as a designer, but also a writer and an educator. Uh, please welcome Bruno Vermeers. Max, you will assist me. Yeah. Do I give a sign or do you have the papers? There are no papers on your table, so uh, I'll give you a sign. Thank you. Katja, thank you for the introduction. Um, the very best of the archipel. <coughs> best of. The greatest hits. They were often the most incoherent records a band ever made. But in their own way, all of them were a pleasing overview when you, had, when you had no ID, or discovered something new. No hidden Spotify algorithm that only results in more and more of the same, but people with knowledge who make a selection. The very best of Prince, Nirvana MTV Unplugged, the 80s, the 90s. The best ofs, I simply loved it. So do I love the Archipri, and it's for me the pleasant task to create some order in this disorder. 25 entries, selected by various juries and nominated for very good reasons. But at the beginning of the jury, we asked Max Rink, hidden and driving, and, and, and driving force behind the Archipli, about the concept behind the layout of the exhibition. He confessed. Plain and simple, nothing special, just an order of entry. Not only did that turn out to be the fairest way, it also said something about the graduate's work ethic. <coughs> yes, a jury lifts every rock. Does the fact that that rewilding farm from Matthijs Spijkers hung next to Exit Urbanism by Max Steinman had nothing to do with their content, nor with the fact that both men could, be, could have been brothers in appearance. Just their speed of action, or the basic fact they wanted to get rid of this, brought them together. I hope the last thing is not the case. Although, in case of Max Steinmann, this is, a, yeah, this is the moment, Max. In case of Max Steinmann, this could be questionable. With this project, he climbs on the barricades 
and calls for an exit from our current thinking and our profession. He fights, he fights the established order, refuses to design, and came up with an activistic pamphlet instead. Exit urbanism. Why do we destroy our neighborhoods to reinstall new ones after this? We can't design perfect neighborhoods. We need the, its inhabitants for this. The same goes for Haulu and his community school. As Marx, Howard neither claims the pencil to design, <coughs> but uses it to write down the stories of his acquaintances and friends. With the community school, he puts watching, listening, and experimenting above the actual design, designed to trigger discussion. Both lonely wolves shouting naked in the desert. That's what they are. But as with wolves, we absolutely need them. Papers are sticking. But does this make other projects where design comes to the surface less activist? Certainly not. But these speakers, Tina Lambert, Sanne Dijkstra, Irene Wu, and Alina da Porcuncola Payas, sorry for the name, are all fighting on behalf of the countryside in their own way. But these speakers battles nearby Breda. With the rewilding farm, Matthijs proposes a climate-adaptive zone and a renewed economy as a driving force behind this transformation. He aims to restore the balance between nature, agriculture and its farming communities. Can we create new perspectives on rural, rural, Europe's rural economy? That's what Mikhail Kaspersky asks. And what would that mean for a countryside? if we shift completely towards a circular economy. Reviving the rural. Not coincidentally, the title of Michael Kaspersky's graduation project. And what would that mean for the communities we create and the houses we make? That was the very question that also on the mind of Yasmin, of Yasmin Quartz. Armed with the ecocentric, and I heard Michael saying, that ego is the, is the main focus, philosophy, does mainly reconsidered Aruba's residential building standards and replaced the egocentric by an egocentric point of view. Design is storytelling. With the Nieuwe Weerde, Sanne Dijkstra tells us the story of the exodus of Groningen, picks up ending storylines and designed three well-chosen buildings to reconnect with the history of Groningen and reverses the, desi the disaster of vacancy into an opportunity. Disaster as resource. Danger, let's go. Everyone must have thought, but not Alina de Porcula, Porcuncola Payas. With Minas, as in Mainz, Alina fights her way back in a flooded region after the authorities, authorities have left the scene. She built a new DNA, but above all, calls for duty where responsibility is key. Let's respond to Alina. Possessed is what you need to be. Irene Wu is possessed by algaes and tackles the rural conditions in a different way. She brings in this new material and targets the potential of algae in every way. It results in a lock full of knowledge, five iconical conical towers and an ever-changing landscape ever changing because for it is now not tomorrow that we must dare to face the looming seizure of the energy transition with solar landscapes of the 21st century Tina Lambert does not look away and rewrites the rules and envisions the future for our countryside it is clear the countryside has renewed its has renewed its attraction but with all the focus on the rural areas, has the city lost its feathers? Certainly not. The city is still omnipresent. Take the burning issue of the housing crisis. With the hometown, San van Haastren puts the city of Eindhoven and the lack of freedom for its inhabitants on the table. To, rega to regain the initiative, Sanne rattles the cage of the current framework, as does 
Alexandra Shapova, with Panelka Beyond Ideology. She opens up existing Soviet architecture, provides it with a new facade, and transforms it into a residential building that meets modern standards. But what do we need? Do we need more freedom? Or do we need freedom by, or, and do we need freedom by or without rules? With Chronotopia, Frank Wortelboer rejected the monochromic spaces of single use, took a deep dive in the collected data and came back with a plan for multi-tenant use of our urban, urban environment. Or is it something else we need? According to Jim Verreiken and Anne van der Berg, we need silence. Silence as a counterweight for the stress we feel. Jim states in his project, emptiness in the urban void. But where Jim proposes a built quiet zone for the city of London, Anne van der Berg runs the other way. With inward, the silence is within. Anna searches for the sounds of the city and its silence within. The, this unconventional line of approach targets existing, if yet, if yet unknown, qualities of the city of Rotterdam and results in an enchanting investigation. Just stop watching, start listening today. But who says silence thinks sound? A space for sound is what Samuel Ching Yatam and Leon Vukler designed. With musical Bing Cross, Samuel crawls with his building through the streets of, Bing, of the Binghorst, a former residential, uh, a former industrial site in The Hague. Leon Vukler takes another position in this. He chose to be part of the industrial heritage of Maastricht and designed a cultural building that rested on top of it. The ready-made approach an approach for any building that still needs to be made. A building with a monumental scale. It is always a challenging, challenging field to explore. Both Wim Speker and Bruce Verdonschot picked up the gauntlet. With the monument of the digital world, Bruce Verdonschot explores the borders of our profession and designs a monument only to be experienced in, in the digital world. The same digital world where the work of Wim Speker for now, only in false. Erwerten is a radical example of autonomous architecture just waiting to be built in the industrial wastelands of the Ruhrgebiet. A region with monumental conditions. That being said, brings us with a blink of the eye to the historical context of Florence, where Rick, ja Rick Jacobs addressed with an impressive historical research research the lost link between the city of Florence and its river. Firenze et Arno. Rick establishes what was lost. On a similar scale, Isabella Trabuco fights for the city of Venice. This project, a project of non-resistance, addresses a greater tendency among denominated entries, namely how to live with the inevitable flooding we can expect in the areas we inhabit. 2021, Limburg was flooded. A disaster that triggered Osariemi Isokpan, and she asked herself a radical question. How can a European city like Maastricht learn from the slums? What can we do when we have nothing left? Or close to nothing? It is Curated decade, I heard today. A toolbox full of special interventions and healthy obsession is what it takes. And that is not the least we can say about the two final nominees. 
Mark van Wasbeek en Steven Vada. Rotterdam versus Amsterdam. Street slang versus a demonstration on the square. Both playing the concept of monumentality and the very last we could say, both brought a monumental piece on the table. Tentoonstelling voor verbeelding and love de zotgeden, even their title could be exchanged. With the love of the Zotgeden, Mark van Wansbeek tries to fix what was once broken. Enriches the Hoogstraat with five follies as gatekeepers of a new, new cultural layer. Steven van Raan, project in Tonstein for Verbeelding, is a critical reflection on the current building practice, in which pragmatism dominates, dominates over historical awareness, realism dominates over surreal, and the generic over the specific. It is an open pledge to detach ourselves from any constraint. Now, not tomorrow, but today. Because, obsession, because without obsession, there would be no culture. Without obsession, there would be no architecture, there would be no design. So, Irene, Max, Jim, Frank, Tinne, Steven, Enrique, Justina, Matthijs, Sanne and Sanne, Mark, Wim, Bruce and Osarim, Isabella and Samuel, Jasmin, Anne, Michael, Alexandra, Alina and Jacobo, Leon and Hau, I'm sure the world will turn you grey. Such a task. <laughs> Not just being in the jury and, and making sense of all these, all these participating plans, but also to mould that into uh, a story like you did. Even more, there's, there's a shitload of sense. <laughs> make it compressed in 10 minutes. I think that's the task. Uh, that's the task, but you did fine. I'm going to move these chairs a little bit to the uh, center. Maybe you can take that one. Because, uh, as promised, uh, we will have a conversation. It's almost like ambushing now, but <laughs> it will be fine, right? So who are the two first uh, participants that you would like to uh, ask to the stage? Um, uh, the first topic we will, we will bring to the debate or discussion is the essence of time, and it's on the screen, thank you. So, uh, Sanne and Jacobo, could you please join our conversation? Yeah, it says the essence of time. Yeah. Yeah, both the projects are talking about short and long term uh, uh, planning. Um, I will start with Sanne. Sanne, in your explanation you state specifically that change does not come overnight. It is a long-term thinking. But what time frames do we need to think of? And, and maybe in combination with that question, do we have the patience for your time frame? Um, you need a, a mic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, uh, Bruno. Um, yeah, I was thinking also about this question, and this question also was raised to me about uh, uh, by my teachers and my mentor Raoul, and the claims. Uh, when we design things as architects, sometimes uh, uh, I was creating this world for these people, uh, a new system and a new way of life. And then I got this question, you know, does this always go? You want know, to install this top down on them, they have to move and uh, you make space for your new way of life, this vision. Or does this go in a different way? And then I was thinking uh, also to answer you about this way. Uh, and this ne never goes. If you, I feel when we want to incorporate uh, people or nature, it's good to take some time. Good things take time. And, and, and it's difficult to have patience, uh, also for me. Uh, but I feel uh, when, we, uh, when you uh, start to uh, think about your design also as a process and not only as an end result, then uh, a lot of nuances can come in. And that's what happens to me also in my process and uh, it enriches this for the people. But I can imagine that you will sit and wait. You will make steps, you will continue. Yeah. Are the, are the, what are the first tiny steps you want to take? You graduated it's a long time ago, I don't know how long it was. Yeah, a year ago. What happened in the past year? Yeah, I had a, yeah, I had a lot of great conversations with people uh, about, uh, and, and also here, uh, there's a lot of familiarity, uh, 
uh, that uh, uh, people are interested in these new ideas of relating towards ourselves, relating towards nature, uh, thinking about this new way. So I feel that it's really much evolving. And this is also taking time. Yeah? We all want uh, to be more nature inclusive. We all want that the people of Groningen or everybody else has their space. But uh, uh, yeah, things yeah, take a little time. And if you would not need to have a, a job or money or anything we all need, um, what would your role be and what would, what, what would the, the dream be to, to enforce your plan for the new building? Well, uh, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, to, uh, to, I think there's a lot of opportunities in the plan to be uh, implemented in these smaller things. Uh, bigger things and uh, yeah uh, it's good to talk to people about that and, and it is also about when we talk specifically about my project uh, it is also about ownership of land because uh, and then we, the question of money comes in uh, because uh, I, we have this vision of the countryside of Groningen and it is owned uh, also by farmers or by other people who earn money with them and uh, we have to also tell, uh, and I try to explain also in my project, that this different way of relating with nature, with, uh, with, with the concept. It does earn money, but it's maybe a little less. And that is the, something that uh, yeah, comes in in these conversations with people. Uh, that, uh, I would, that's, that's, can we live it a little less? So an architect becomes an economical thinker, a landscape architect, it needs to be be generous to make it work. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Your neighbor, Jacobo. No, yeah, um, I mean, related to this uh, issue of uh, of revenue of land, you know, of, uh, uh, at least, uh, I don't know, in my experience with my project, I think it uh, has a lot to do with the question of value, you know, like when you, and it relates also to the issue of time, you know, when you start to look at things, uh, at places in a kind of extended uh, temporal frame, you see that you know things might have values that are not strictly economical and, um, and might have value also for non-human beings or uh, yeah other sort of others. <laughs> and for both of you, the the, the effect of, of decay or vacancy seems to be really an important trigger. Um, Mike also talked about the curated decay. Can we, should we enforce the decay, speed up the decay, to gain back the land? So more of a... Uh, yeah, I, I don't know, it's a good question actually, because it's, uh, I mean, it's something that happens spontaneously, you know? It's, it's kind of, uh, uh, things tend to decay, and, uh, and on the other hand, we are used uh, to think in modern terms, uh, to, to kind of try to save things from decay, but... I don't know if the idea of uh, manipulating uh, decay uh, and kind of accelerating it uh, as a process, I don't know if, you know, if it's, if it's needed. Or, or it is what cities do. Um? It is what cities and builders do. Uh. Enforce, enforcing vacancy, they have their tools. We can learn from maybe from those tools to speed up your project. Yeah, because if you talk about uh, curating decay, there's also this, this, this element of choice, of course, in there. Huh? There's some things you yeah. don't mind if they fall into decay and other things you want to keep. Yeah, yeah definitely. I mean, this still relates to the question of value, you know, understanding what things you might tackle and what things you might want to preserve and what other things you, you can just accept uh, that they you know, are taken over by, uh, by others. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I also feel that it is important that uh, we don't control everything. Yeah? And it was also interesting from the, from the lecture from you, Mike, that we create these boundaries or these uh, uh, scenes that, that there is uh, yeah, leftover space or, or some space uh, that uh, we don't intervene. But, uh, Waiting grounds. Waiting for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and how long, how long is your role, for especially for Jacobo, it, it seems to be your curating a design process, or is it a toolbox and you, uh, or are you only part of the process until the end of your life? Yeah, I mean, um, 
Yeah, I guess it's a, it's a, it's a commitment that, uh, that goes uh, beyond uh, a specific time frame and also goes beyond a specific place, I think. Um, I mean, at the moment I am trying to, you know, continue the research uh, on the very same place, so it's a, uh, but more in trying to understand it historically, so uh, looking at, uh, at uh, trying to create another image of, of this place by understanding uh, different uh, other perspectives on it, and I think this is uh, something that we can, you know, Share, that can be shared then to, 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 other, yeah, to others. And, um, so yeah, I see my role a bit in, in this sense as a kind of, um, yeah, as a, as a committed person to, <laughs> to... An everlasting life work, I would say. I, I guess, yeah, it's, a, it's yeah, I guess, it's, I mean, it's a, understand, it's, a, it's a shift of mentality that uh, requires time. <laughs> It's that seems, seems only fitting for the essence of time, the theme of this small conversation. Thank you both very much. Thank you both. Thank you both. It's good there's no more corona. Um, <laughs> Lessons from the outside. Um, I would love to bring uh, to, to ask Max Taiman. En Osarime Isokpan to the stage, please. Yeah. Okay, both, both very welcome uh, from the outside. Um, uh, Osarime, I, 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 we want to start with you. Um, uh, with your project, Learning from Slums, as I also thought, what kind of European city learned from the slums. You've used the tools of an interior, arch uh, interior architect to make architecture. So that my first question would be, being in that position that would make you the perfect outsider to look at the profession of architecture. What did you see? That's a good question. Um, I think for me, in my project, or what I was trying to do was to also question the role of the architect. And what I was trying to basically say is everyone is an architect. Everyone has the innate nature to build. So I think just that's, yeah, that's what I was trying to achieve, just to kind of show that you don't really need architects, even though... <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, I was just basically saying you don't really... You're making friends. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm just basically saying you don't really, in, especially in the situation of collapse of society, um, I feel as though in certain scenarios, architects are not needed. And I was just trying to highlight that the layman can build mm -hmm. and we should also get inspiration from structures that come from someone without this formal training building. I see someone next to you really nodding. <laughs> you skip the script, Max. I, uh, Do we need them? Uh, I think we need them a lot less. Oh. It might be good if we would have some less. Okay. I'll come back to you later. <laughs> um, but maybe it's a, it's, it's the right thing to say. So when, the, when we have a collapse of that moment, the architect is not really omnipresent. It, it's not the one. So we learn from the slums. Um, but what, what, what key things did you learn that you want to share with the audience? Um, and what can we learn from you doing this? Um, I think for me, uh, just some context on my project. Um, my project was learning from a slum in Lagos, Nigeria called Makoko. And it's over 250,000 people who live in this community. Um, what I personally wanted to achieve was to kind of bring to attention that, you know, we have in the world over one billion people living in slums. And I felt as though it is important for us to also look into these areas as inspiration, as architects, um, especially if we think of just the amount of people. Um, so being in this community, um, it was me also removing all the preconceived biases that I have as an architect, but also that I have as a Nigerian myself, um, I'm not from these areas, but I think for me, I had to humble myself to go in, 
to seek permission to also do this project. So it was a way for me to also kind of connect with people that I may not react, relate with every day, but also to kind of see myself as learning from them and to also just observe how do you build a community, especially in adverse situations. Um, there's some images that you can also see over there. Um, but it's also just kind of showing that you have hotels, you have schools, churches, and it's really just, I feel like I was more just valuing what had been built. Um, so for myself personally, I think what I learned, although I did have my project come out of it, um, I've questioned my project now, but um, my project did come out of it, but what I really learned was also to kind of rethink um, how I see the world and also what I see as inspirational. So learn to value the things we have. Basically, yes. <laughs> I think that's a really good lesson to, to take from the outside to the inside. Um, Max, you're already part of the discussion by, by reacting on, on less architects. It sounds like a political statement to me. Um, my first active memory of you was you walking through the academy with a big white ball in your head. Was that? And I think maybe Mike also saw him walking around in the academy and some other people from. Um, was it the first step of exit urbanism? Um, or do I? Uh, yeah, I think I've never been the, 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 the general urbanist. No, never a normal one at least. <laughs> the normal one. It's a difficult discussion. I won't ask you for the definition, but... Um, but uh, your project is actually, it, it is an open invitation uh, to step out of your profession. Um, we also read the correspondence with the academy. It's even maybe an open call to drop out of the current uh, educational system. So maybe a bold question to begin with. You are now, I think, two years graduated. Looking back, do you have enough distance, or did you were you able to step outside all these tiny frustrations and big ambitions? Uh, well, I did step outside. I, I work at an office, not as a sort of a full hardcore designing urbanist, but more as a, something I think an urbanist should do, <laughs> way more a facilitating role. So helping people reach what they would want their neighborhood to be, for example, and helping the, the municipalities in uh, reaching uh, uh, their facilitating role for <laughs> inhabitants. Uh, I, I do think I had enough time to reflect, but that does not take away frustrations at all. It's the opposite. Uh, you want to do more? Me? No, I think, uh, I think we need more uh, designers that take more responsibility in saying maybe it's not a good idea to, 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 to design here or to even participate in a, in a tender on a certain spot. It's not a good idea to destroy this neighborhood. For example? Um, you refuse to design. Um, <laughs> but what do you own instead? A different way of thinking you mentioned? Yeah, well... If you see that something is better than that what you might put back, then I think it's a very uh, easy choice not to do something. And this particular neighborhood, they managed to get all the focus away from money, uh, but all the other values, so not the economic value, but ecological and about community value and about uh, sharing. Uh, and I think those things are way more important than uh, money, basically. Oh, that's a clear Someone message. disagrees? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, hearing you thinking back on my first question, was the white ball the first step of exit urbanism? Yeah, sure. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe an invitation for being less blindfolded. For the yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, thank you. New roles, wait, what new roles? The list could be endless, but we, we want to invite Justina and Irene to the stage, please, to talk about our new roles. Justina. Well, we, maybe we should say that these people that we ask on the stage are chosen as typical representatives of this uh, generation. Um, we could have chosen many others, but here we are. Um, 
Hello both. With Max and uh, Osarima, we already made like a first step outside of our profession. Um, but with your projects, I would even dare to say that you uh, both step beyond the role of, uh, of being a designer. It's, it's hidden in the title of the project, uh, Core of Your Silence. So, but I start with uh, Irene. Um, and maybe I share something with the audience, but none of all us want, will read everything they, they write. It's beautiful writing in big booklets. It's, uh, it's, it's an enormous effort that I've never made in my educational project, pro program. But Irene, which, uh, I want to uh, open with your opening statement and then maybe ask a question after this, if that's okay. Irene writes about her own project. It is an innovative project. It is a material-based project. It is research of an organism. It is built from microalgaes. It is built for the material. It is built for the ecosystem. It is built for the landscape. It's about nature culture. It's about the basics of life cycle. So it is architecture. You, you, this is, would be like an, a pledge for an enormous upgrade of our architectural profession. Uh, I would say. Um, or would you maybe rather call it a specialization? Um, yeah, I wrote it as more um, manifesto for my project, uh, which is, I, yeah, I see the role, what is the architect, uh, is not just a pure architect, uh, because in the general concept, architect is more building a shelter for humans, but on my point of view, it's like Micah saying, we as a human, is also part of the nature. So uh, why architects need to specific to building for people, but not something for the ecosystem or even for the material itself. So uh, that is also in my project, the questioning about like why architects, architecture need to be like a permanent uh, object, but can be also seen as a life object. And not, you, you blow me away one thing, stop designing for people architects. Uh, and when, the, when, the, when buildings stop, that's all focused on nature. Uh, or would that not be the desire of Mike? No, but then I think actually, yeah, nature and human actually is uh, living together. Like when you're building something better for the nature, then we also live in better as well. So it's uh, coming back and forth to each other. So uh, that is also what I want to emphasize uh, nowadays, like to open up this um, point of view, like just not only too much focus on our own human life, but also the life around us, even the microalgae, which is the, the smallest organism in the mm. world. Uh, tell us something about the material, and, and, and maybe in combination, the role of the architect in material investigations. What role should we play? Uh, like, as I mentioned, actually it's a big um, hit up with my background that I study science and art in my, before my master study. So that has come across like all this knowledge we want to bring together like more design, uh, like an artist making craft, but also um, to innovate some new material. So also um, kind of yeah, reflect myself like architect always talking about the sustainability uh, in the architecture, how to use the material. But on the other hand, can we actually make some material and grow our own material instead just using it and uh, but creating it. Material experts. <laughs> Justina, um, would you question to go to Dansk? Uh, yeah. Um, there were nature by, by humans disappeared, uh, selling property, tucking away the river, tucking away the nature. Um, that, that must have been frustrated, frustrating for you to see. Mm, yeah, it was. <laughs> I, I've observed uh, the disappearance myself, uh, together with my family actually, and the river Strzyża uh, was a topic um, at home during, well, dinners, <laughs> conversations. Um, so it Even was, since you were young? Yeah, since I was young. Um, I mean, I know the stream well, like um, I was going with my grandfather um, on trips along it and um, I also grew up very close by um, so yeah we've been also yeah really witnessing the disappearance the sole disappearance of it was it the hidden reason why you stepped into this profession um, or is that, is I, I don't I'm not sure <laughs> frustration frustration about hidden nature but, um, 
But what would your role now be? So you've, you've witnessed the killings. Um, uh, you stepped into the academy. You, grad you graduated with a beautiful project. Um, but what would your role now be as an landscape architect to stop this madness, what is still going on? Um, or, or should we even stop humanity? I don't think we should stop humanity. Um, I think, I mean, I was thinking about it, yeah, what, like somehow where my inspirations also were coming from. And why did I approach um, my project in a way of, yeah, storytelling and uh, also just raising awareness about the disappearance of the river more than um, actually making a design after all. And I think it's because of, um, because of, I think, uh, influence of um, journalism. I, I can see a little bit of a, yeah, investigative journalism as a discipline that um, influenced me or my project. Also because of observing my mom my whole life being an investigative journalist herself. Uh, so I think telling stories about um, disappearing landscapes and um, yeah, disappearing nature. Yeah, and creating tools. To creating tools, to exactly. Mm -hmm. And also sharing it with people. That was really my drive also. Yeah. And when you made, I mean, the final question, when you made your plan, and I don't know when the title comes in the beginning of the end, but uh, choreography and resilience, it's choreography. And as we all know, choreography can suddenly turn completely the other way. Um, how important is a fixed endpoint for you within a choreography as you've worked it out? Or is it just about the tools and an example you say you, you make? I think it's definitely more in this way for me about the process or starting something. And, um, I, and also then allowing for the chaos that might be um, a result of the first action. So, um, in, in a way, I, I believe it would be good to let go sometimes of um, yeah, our idea of what the fixed result should be. And um, yeah, a starting point, that's also strong yeah. um, as a designer. The song starts with the sound. Yeah. And the dance with the move. Yes. And this is your first step. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. I suddenly have many microphones. <laughs> um, we're going to the parts uh, that you've all been waiting for, the actual award ceremony. <coughs> Every edition of Archipri has its own jury for which inspiring experts from the fields of architecture, urban planning, landscape architecture and interior architecture are invited. This year's jury had the following members. Janneke Bierman for architecture, Darius Resnek for landscape architecture, Lisa van der Slot, urban design, Bruno Vermeers, we just saw him, interior architecture, and Johan de Walse for theory and research. Secretary to the jury is Max Rink of Archipri sitting over there, and uh, the jury report was prepared in association with Sandino Ursilla. Joining me on stage is one of the jury members. She is principal at Biermann Henket. For many years she worked as an educator at the Faculty of Architecture at Delft Technical University, focusing on reuse, restoration and transformation. Uh, she is an architect cherishing the connection with the built past, both in her work as an architect, but also in a whole array of other positions and functions that she has, like being the head of Dokomomo and at present being the chair of the Rietveld uh, Schroederhuis Foundation and many, many other things, very impressive. We are delighted that she's here with us today, Janneke. Yeah. So Janneke, we have the honor, right? Or you have the honor, uh, I should say. 
Um, general information on the entrance of Arctic Brie 2023, maybe. How many institutes have sent in a plan? I believe there were 10 institutions, so that's quite a lot. Uh, 10 institutions, 25 entries. So we had to do a lot of work to, to go through all these uh, uh, great projects, but very different from each other, of course. And they graduated in all these different fields. I believe there was one that did architecture and urban planning. Yeah, there were architects plans and urbanist plans and interior plans also. So yeah, so the majority plans. maybe was again architecture, but yeah, judging from what's going on, that might even change, it might become more of landscape architecture. We'll see in the coming years. Um, a large variety of projects, different institutions. How did the jury approach the job? of assessing all these uh, projects. Can you explain a bit about yeah, the Yeah, we had uh, two days in March, mm. actually, we, uh, because uh, they were all exhibited uh, in, in, uh, in Delft at the university. So we had one day to go through all the uh, different projects and then we took home all the books that were made. Uh, we uh, distributed them among all the jury members. Uh, because we really wanted to see the re uh, result of the research also. And then the second day we went into depth to all the, uh, the projects. And uh, then in the end there's a jury report that will be displayed uh, online, I believe, uh, where we also say something about all the projects, because of course all the projects are winners as well. Yes, um, it's important to state that, because they were selected by the schools, by the academies, so they were the very best uh, at their academy and their university. So this is a generation of the best graduates. So and we're celebrating that and then moving on to the best of the very best. <laughs> um, okay. Janneke, why don't I give you uh, the lecture? Yeah. You can go we ahead. wrote it down, of course, so I want to uh, say a little bit about our general uh, uh, go ahead. things, the, the jury. Um, we uh, identified some mainstream trends, which you already saw a little bit uh, uh, of uh, what is already said before. Uh, among the projects that stand out, and the jury has also some general remarks for the benefit of the institutions involved. Many projects display an innovative stance but adopted by their designers. Designers are always are looking for a new effective design strategy to place social and climatological problems on the agenda and address them. For, for example, they take the role of choreographer or social activator, a role that enables others to take action. The designer looks for minimal interventions aimed at achieving maximum effect. It is from pilot studies that the designer's own methods, toolboxes and atlases were developed foregrounding their urge to seek out the right design strategy. The jury really appreciate in this respect an attitude among those entrants who delay making the design. First, they build up sufficient understanding before embarking on design proposals and interventions. Depending on the degree of which graduation design is research-based, this can produce something other than a realizable building, interior, landscape, or urban design. And the jury hopes that academic institutions will even be more <coughs> open to this attitude in future. There were few projects nominated where the design proposal consists of a classical architectural or urban project, which for years uh, formed the lion's shares of Arcabri entries. Likewise, there are no projects where building technology stands uh, to take center stage. In this edition of Arcabri, the relevance of resides in strategic, multidisciplinary, and multidisciplinary responses. The challenges that are facing us today cannot be resolved purely in terms of sustainability or the social perspective. 
Designers are aware of the fact that a new aesthetic is needed with a more extensive layering in which such aspects as appreciation of the existing, social cohesion and climate adaptation come together. And the nominated projects are notable for their quest for a new kind of beauty that accepts and is comfortable with what is already there. It is striking that many projects are self-initiative. Projects which through their personal nature invite dialogue and give evidence to a strong commitment of social issues. It is to that credit that many, uh, of many nominees that their key design premise is to build less, to do less, and proceeding with the, from the existing identity and to identify what is already to hand and what is essential to the task. The best projects among the nominees are informed by an understanding of the complexity designers have to deal with and an awareness that they can only influence a small part of that complexity. The successful projects operate from an open attitude, a deep focus, personal drive and great dedication, at, some time, at the same time accepting that the design can never be complete or all-inclusive. As they work on their graduation project, students become experts in their chosen subject and their expertise raises them to a position that is authentic and theirs alone. The jury identifies a critical tension between this solo response and its goal in, a, in reality, namely the present solutions that design briefs that need to be addressed urgently. So, there's also a bigger goal, and how can we collaborate together? Where it wonders, is there the right balance to be found in this solo approach of fire versus uh, working together? Taking the entries of this year's nominees as a whole, the jury established that something is afoot in the field of spatial design. There's an ur inherent urge to develop a new aesthetic for present day, to tackle the, the pressing issues that face us now and in the future. Strategies, toolboxes, atlases, they have all been developed and what you see here also in the exhibition. And they are to con contribute to all these uh, difficult issues that we have to face with. To honor and to do justice to, uh, to the abundance and diversity of all the entries, we have decided as a jury to award three first prizes <laughs> and one honorable bench. Yes. So everybody is uh, a bit surprised. Mm -hmm. <laughs> three first prizes. Is that, could you do that as a jury? Did you have? Yeah, we can do that as a jury. <laughs> so we were very happy with that because we didn't want to choose. There are so many uh, different strategies that were investigated and we want to award its different strategies <laughs> to face uh, the world from all of now. So, yeah. 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 Oh, that's super exciting. I'm going to make a bit of space on this, <laughs> on this stage. Um, I think uh, maybe you should go ahead and start with the honorable mention. Yeah, we will start with the honorable mention first. I think when I start talking, the, the, the one who is involved will uh, immediately understand, but I'll start. This graduation project gives an unexpected perspective on slums. <laughs> Namely, that these can be a rich source of inspiration for survival strategies in the event of a flooding of an urban environment. It presents an alternative to prevailing design concepts. It is a fundamental rethink of how we can organize and give shape to our living environment from a new perspective on raw materials, urgency and dynamics for transformation. The project shows that the scale of the interior can impact on the entire city that a radical perspective with a small focus can achieve great impact. Learning from Srums, the, the new vernacular by Ozarime Isopan from the Academy of Bakken van Maastricht.
Wow, uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm really honored. Um, I'd like to thank my school, Joseph, and my teachers for all the support, all my friends, my family. Uh, this project uh, really means a lot to me. I think it really made me question a lot of things, question myself, question my profession, um, but also it made me look beyond, I guess, what is normal, but also to have I'm, I'm very happy now, so I'm just, I'm just, I'm really happy, um, I'm really happy that I'm able to bring this project to this audience, and my goal also is really to bring awareness to a lot of issues that we face in society, be it global warming, climate change, but also the extreme situations that people reside in. I'm not trying to say we should wipe away slums, that is not the essence of my project, rather my project is to appreciate informality and hopefully as architects we can learn more from these areas. So, thank you. It's all the banks. Continue with the first winner. The personal, intuitive, and artistic approach creates unique perspectives and ways of thinking that present a dramatic alternative to established design methods. This graduation study presents itself as a recall to reinstate intuition fantasy and imagination in architecture. To this end, the designer set about finding a way to disconnect from all the frameworks and expectations that architects are faced with. A combination of surrealism and associative thinking is stepped up to conceive an architecture able to act upon and activate the collective memory. Designer, the designer has made a truly remarkable job of organizing the complexity of the project's immense quantity of collages, drawings, models and studies in order to arrive at architecture. Unlike the other winning entries, this project activates the designer first and foremost as a craftsman and a first-rate design talent. Tentoonstelling for Verbeelding, Steven van Raan from the Academy <laughs> Kind words, super nice. I'm really honored. Maybe you can explain a little bit, a bit about, about your strategy, about your, my way, strategy. your way of working. So it was very, very personal. I, uh, I came up uh, uh, with my combination of fascination for art and uh, fascination for drawing, and um, yeah, start my whole design uh, um, with how surrealistic uh, art is made. Um, for I uh, use like three uh, different kind of uh, methods they use. For example, uh, the cadaver esquis. Um, so it's a, it's a way to uh, to to design the unexpected, uh, I guess, and to get loose of uh, the strict strictness in a, in a plan. Um, in the end, it results in a really layered uh, concept of uh, with a lot of history and a lot of uh, colors and design. And, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I really want to thank my, uh, my tutors, my mentor, uh, Bob Hootsmans, uh, uh, Paul Kuipers and Melis Boteman for their effort. I want to thank my friends and family for all their support. Oh, that's so nice. Can, can I oh, ask you one more right. question? <laughs> okay. um, I think my mic is not working. Um, ah, yeah, so there it comes up. Um, so I was, I was really intrigued by the fact that you want to include intuition. Uh, Arti artistry, the personal in the design process. We live in a world that's run by money, time is money. How would you convince a client or an employer to take more time for these parts of the process? What would be your argument? Mm, yeah, that's a good one. 
I think we all have the uh, same uh, issues as designers. Um, but maybe we can think that the end result has more quality when the design is a bit longer and more well thought of. Um, and then, like, maybe it's in the end more sustainable because it will stand for a, a longer period and keep its quality. Maybe Sounds that good. could be an argument. Sounds good. Sounds good. Congratulations. Here you are. understanding of water management in all its facets has produced a very convincing design strategy. It empowers those who are in the wheel to wield this strategy and moves them to action. It is a well-targeted and viable line of approach and makes a convincing case of citizen activation within a broader plan. It proposes a series of what are often do-it-yourself strategies at different scales which enable local communities and municipal council to take immediate action. The proposed strategies attest a good understanding of the responsibilities and decisiveness of the various players in relation to their capacity to make the aimed at transformation really happen. Design that digs deeper into ways of objectifying the necessity, necessary actions at the level of the local residents. With a strong, strong focus on circular material use. In all this, the designer is spot on, conscientious, scrupulous and dedicated. The superb models do not apologize for the dilapidated courtyards of this residential the residential neighborhoods of Gdansk, oh. but instead embrace this reality so as to take immediate action. Choreographic resilience, Justina Kilevska, I hope I pronounced it well, of the Academy of Baukens Amsterdam Landscape. <laughs> Yes, congratulations with your magnificent player. Um, yeah, thank you so much. It's it's an honor. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I will start actually with thanking, <laughs> uh, thanking everybody who, who was also part of um, my process, and also all the people that were around me who inspired me, um, and especially my family who you know. Like was a was a big part of the yeah bringing this subject on the surface and uh, on the table at home. So um, did you really present it also in Gdansk? Did you, uh, no, I didn't. But oh. my family saw it uh, the project. Um, yeah, and to tell a bit about the project. Um, yeah. Um, would, would you like to bring it to uh, the table, maybe, in Gdansk, and see... see, um, see yeah, I think thing. actually it would be quite provocative, yeah. uh, in a way, because, of course, I mean, if I would present it to the, for example, the government, mm -hmm. uh, it's provocative in a sense that it addresses the issue of privatization of land and privatization of nature. So, yeah, for this reason, I think it would be an interesting um, conversation. So maybe yeah. also with the recent political exactly. shift, it true. Could be yeah, could yeah, have a better chance, maybe. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, the the current um, yeah government is more involved in ecology, um, so maybe they would be more open than the previous one to talk about it. And you really have something to present because you have all these beautiful models, and it's it's so uh, attractive to to, mm. to see the strategy. So I would really recommend yeah. to do that. Yeah. Thank you. And also, I wanted to add that this is not the issue of just one city and one district, but it's actually an issue in the whole country. So, Sorry. <laughs> um, 
yeah, it's really on, on the scale of of whole Poland and uh, yeah. So you you are uh, looking at the strategy to do it also in your your uh, professional work uh, mm -hmm. to use it also. Yeah, well, hopefully. hopefully. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Okay, I would you? love to give you these plants. Here you go. <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> then we proceed to the third and last winner. Proceeding from an extensive focused study, this project consistently presents historical political and architectural theory, uh, theoretical arguments so as to arrive at architecture. Armed with a philosophy of enough is enough, the project succeeds in achieving the greatest impact with a minimum of means. The study takes a critical look at the region's history and the future potentials. The perspective is one of understanding and love of buildings, the landscape and its inhabitants, whether human, animal or plants. He provides a toolbox so as to be able to respond, simply choose to return certain buildings to nature and redevelop others. This means that restoring the architecture is not all-inclusive and that only the components that really need it get a design. Today's desire to reduce buildings to un a uniform total experience is deftly dismantled and presented as a magnificent assembly of fragments. The jury was deeply impressed by the loving care with which the dilapidated buildings have been repaired. The detailed fragments make the designer's concept credible, but in turn rendering the project's ultimate aim credible too. The designer has succeeded admir admirably in creating a new aesthetic that invites other ways to accommodate the existing. Garden of Dialectics, a story of decay and reconstruction by Jacopo Zani Theodelft. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, I don't really know what to say. I, you know, it's, a, it's a great, I mean, it's a great honor to be uh, between all these beautiful projects. I have to say, it's really, it's been really nice to see all this col collective effort. And, and yeah, I mean, um, I obviously I, I want to thank uh, my tutors that have been extremely supportive throughout all the process and. Not all, and all the other people that outside of the academic world have also been quite supportive in this sense. Yeah. So my family, my friends, and yeah, my partner, and nice. yeah. Maybe you can explain a bit about your strategy and how you are going to continue yeah. working on that in your uh, professional life. Is yeah, that something that you are still working on. Yeah, at the moment I am actually I'm de I'm still developing the research on. Uh, yeah, well, you already explained. Yeah, yeah, I am I'm doing a PhD and uh, so I'm not directly actly acting architecturally wise I would say, but more on a kind of theoretical uh, base and trying to bring other voices within a history that is often narrated in a, in a, a monodirectional way. And this is the kind of work I'm doing and I try to also to share it with the people that actually still in bit these places. And yeah. Um, Very interesting. Sounds, sounds good. <laughs> yeah. So, so going to work on the lack of love maybe for history, you What's yeah, Is that what you're doing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. Uh, I guess it's. Uh, yeah. I mean, not only an historical understanding, but also a work I'm developing in trying to develop new lenses to to look at. Uh, so the project itself was on a, on a, a former mining territory in, uh, in actually in the Belgian Limburg, and I mean this 
places are often stigmatized as uh, economic activities of you know uh, slowly uh, decayed and so um, yeah but there's worth there's value yeah there's, there's value yes. also and uh, yeah the kind of work and uh, I think also the the shift in mentality I I had in the sense is also that all these uh, economic activities or uh, exploitations that have been going on in these places have created new conditions that often you don't find in in other places. So they have even more value in certain ways. Right. To, yeah. Sounds exciting. Can I give you this as well? <laughs> and one round of applause. So, um, thank you all, thank you Yamaka for um, the jury uh, reports, I'm going to try and leave them there for that point. Um, there is one part of the program that we have to take care of, it involves a bit of choreography because we want to, for everybody to know what happened here today and who won, so we're taking a couple of, and who participated, let's not forget that, so we're taking a couple of photographs. I'm going to first invite all the participants for the photo, then just the honorable mentions and the winners can stay, and then we'll ask um, the chair of Arcapri and the jury to join for that last photo. So the first one, uh, Ernst is our photographer. Where do you want all participants to stand? Five to Over here? Over there? Okay, let's let's decide. Okay, so all participants please